the Nazis, and nuclear weapons. Now that is a mix that is deeply unpleasant to think about, but at one point in time, that was a very real possibility. For the majority of the Second World War, the scientists and administrators of the Manhattan Project, the nuclear program for the United States, firmly believed that they were in a race with Germany in order to be able to develop the nuclear bomb first. Now, ironically enough, as it turns out, the Germans were not actually close to developing a usable weapon. But Allied planners were only able to confirm this later on in the war and even going into after the war with the Alsus program which was an intelligence mission that was sent at the end of the war in order to be able to investigate German nuclear capabilities. Now, as for why that is the case, there are multiple reasons, but that is going to require covering probably in another full video, which we'll need to do another time. I will say, though, that one of the key factors was the daring and very impressive sabotage that was pulled off by some Norwegian soldiers back in the 1940s, and that this was going to slow or stop access to a key ingredient that the Nazis needed for their nuclear program, heavy water. Now, before I go and tell the story of this whole crazy exploit, I feel the need to go ahead and kind of explain what it is that heavy water, well, is. I mean, hell, even today, when people at least have some kind of rudimentary understanding of what a nuclear bomb is and how fission works when it comes to splitting atoms. Few people have really any idea of what heavy water is or what its role is in the whole fission process. And even fewer people understand as to why the Germans needed this substance, whereas the Americans just really didn't. And now mind you, I am not a chemist, I'm not a physicist, I'm not any other kind of scientist that you can possibly imagine. I'm instead just a guy on the internet who tells stories for people's entertainment on a platform that is simultaneously also used for cat videos and twerking videos. So I'm no scientist, but I will do my best to explain it. Like I know that we're all familiar with water, simple H2O, which is composed of two hydrogen and one oxygen atoms. Well, heavy water is just that. It is water, but heavier, as the name literally just says. The difference is, is that if regular water has a molecular weight of 18, then heavy water is going to have a weight of 20, of 20 atomic mass units, or AMU. The reason that it is heavier is because the hydrogen atoms in it are isotopes that are heavier than normal hydrogen. And I'm showing this video right here from Periodic Videos, which is a chemistry channel that can go way more in-depth than I am personally capable of doing when talking about about the behavior of heavy water and whether or not you're capable of drinking it. And the thing is, if we're talking about things in terms of chemistry, then heavy water and normal water pretty much behave similarly. If you were just looking at it, you wouldn't really notice any difference if heavy water all of a sudden started coming out of your kitchen faucet. But what you would notice is that if you made ice cubes out of heavy water and then put that into a glass of regular water, then the heavy water ice cubes would actually sink instead of float because they're more dense. Cool, okay, awesome. We're talking about floating and sinking ice cubes, but still Stack, what does any of this have to do with nuclear weapons? Why does this matter? Well, hold on, I am getting to that part. This is, just, it takes a little bit more time to process this, all right? So when fast neutrons are released by the splitting of atoms in nuclear fission, these would pass through heavy water, and when that happens, the neutrons are slowed down. This is important because slower moving neutrons are more efficient at splitting uranium atoms than fast moving neutrons. And more efficiency means less uranium is needed in order to be able to achieve critical mass, which is that point in which everything goes Boom! It is the chain reaction within critical mass that releases the explosive energy that is desired in a bomb. And so that is why the Germans needed heavy water. This was going to be their strategy that they needed in order to be able to produce anything that was capable of a nuclear explosion. Now for reference, the American scientists did not actually need heavy water, which was a very big difference between them. And the reason for that was because the material that they were using was enriched uranium. Uranium that has an increased concentration of the easily split uranium-235, while the Germans were using unenriched uranium. The Americans had been able to slow their enriched uranium with more readily available graphite rather than heavy water. And while each approach has its trade-offs and also its benefits, the biggest trade-off of having to use heavy water is that you were going to have to synthesize it because it was so incredibly rare. This was very easily the biggest weakness of the entire German nuclear program. That, among other things, like kicking out a lot of the scientists that you needed in the first place to be able to do the research that would have helped your program in the first place. But again, story for another day. I mean, when we were talking about how rare heavy water is in nature, in many cases, we're talking about one in a billion for the amount that is being produced in terms of, you know, water molecules. I don't even know how I would begin to describe this. Again, I'm not a chemist, but because of that rarity, that means that the Germans would have to synthesize all of the heavy water that they were going to be using. Thus, if you want to hurt the German nuclear program, that means that the only thing you really had to do was to go after the water source. Which brings us 
to this boy here. The hydroelectric power plant at Vimork in Norway was built back in the year 1934, and it was the world's first site to mass produce heavy water, with the capacity of being able to produce 12 tons per year. After the Nazis would invade Norway in 1940 and capture it, this right here was going to become the chief plant that the Nazis were going to use in order to be able to fuel their nuclear program. Or at least that was the plan, anyway. Between the year 1940 and 1944, there was going to be a series of sabotage actions by the Norwegian resistance movement, along with allied bombing that would try to knock the plant out of commission. In Operation Grouse, the British had successfully managed to place an advanced team of four Norwegians on the Hardinger Plateau above the plant on October of 1942. Operation Freshman was then mounted the following month by British paratroopers who were supposed to rendezvous with the Operation Grouse Norwegians and then proceed to Vimork to take out the plant. However, this, um, th this did not go well at all. The plan would fail when the military gliders would end up crashing short of their destination, and except for the crew of one Halifax bomber, all of the participants were either killed or captured by the the Germans and then interrogated, tortured, and executed. Which then brings us to Operation Gunnerside and the actions of a few brave Norwegians. See, rather than repeating the British strategy of just sending dozens of men in gliders that were then flying also with heavy weapons and equipment and bicycles and everything else that you can imagine that also probably was going to be difficult to use in heavy snow conditions, the Norwegians were instead going to use an alternate strategy. Instead, what they decided to do was to parachute a small group of expert skiers into the wilderness that surround the plant and that these lightly armed skiers would then be very quickly able to ski their way to the plant and use stealth rather than force in order to be able to try and get into the plant. Once they were in, the plan was to then destroy everything with explosives. So six Norwegian soldiers were dropped in to meet up with four that were already on location, and once on the ground, they were joined by a Norwegian spy. The 11-man group then moved forward, but were initially slowed by severe weather conditions. But once the weather finally cleared, the men began to make rapid progress towards their ultimate destination. As they got closer, they found that the Vimork plant clung to a steep hillside, and upon arriving at the ravine that served as a kind of protective moat around it, the soldiers could see that attempting to just cross it and the heavily guarded bridge was not something that was going to be feasible for them. So instead, under the cover of darkness, they decided to go to the bottom of the ravine, cross the frozen stream, and climb up the steep cliffs to the plant, which would completely bypass the bridge. The Germans at the time had thought that no one was going to be stupid enough to do this, so they just didn't really bother setting additional guards around the area. They assumed that everyone would have to go by bridge. The Norwegians were then able to sneak past the sentries and find their way to the heavy water production room, relying on maps that had been provided to them by workers and resistance fighters who had already done intelligence gathering. And upon entering the heavy water room, they quickly set their explosives and left. They managed to escape the scene during the chaotic aftermath of the explosion, and not only was not a single life lost, but simultaneously not a single shot was fired from a gun during this entire operation. Once outside of the plant, the men simply backtracked their way through the ravine and then split into small groups that independently would ski towards different destinations, with many of them breaking free to get over to neutral Sweden. And despite the fact that over 3,000 German soldiers were going to be sent after them in order to be able to try and capture them, none of them would succeed. Eventually, each man would make his way back to the Norwegian unit that was stationed in Britain. It was just that clean of an operation. Now, of course, all things considered, the operation, though successful, did not stop nuclear ambitions for Germany entirely. The Germans were able to later rebuild the plant and then use it again to start producing more heavy water. But because of this whole incident that we just now described, they ended up buffing security significantly so that it couldn't be done against them again. And because of this increased security, the Allies realized that another commando operation simply was not going to be feasible, and so they had to rely instead on air raids. And so over the course of the next year, the Allies were going to launch repeated raids against the site, and the Germans, not believing that they were going to be able to hold it, decided to abandon the site in 1944. Either way, even if it wasn't necessarily decisive, Operation Gunnerside was still an important nail in the coffin of the German nuclear program. And it was something that was only made possible by the daring actions of a few brave individuals. And that is why I firmly believe that it is a fun and great story to tell. Everyone, this has been Stakui with the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. Thank you very much for watching. I ask that you like, comment, subscribe, and let me know in the comment section below what it is that we should cover next. Don't forget to check out my links in the description and the trips that I'm going to be leading here in the future, Patreon, and everything else. Besides that, I hope you'll have a good rest of your day, and thank you once again for watching. Goodbye, everyone.